we're going to go ahead and start. And the first, so first off, welcome to the uh, endorsement interview for Super District 8, position of 1 for the Memphis City Council. And we've got four of the candidates here. And I'm going to start with a, a pretty standard question we do it with all the uh, candidates. And that is, why are you running for the office and what do you hope to do if you win? I'm going to start with you first. Do you have a timekeeper? Uh, I'll be the timekeeper. Okay. And what I'll do when your time is up, I'll raise my pen. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Good. Good morning again, and thank you all for this opportunity. My name is Pearl Eva Walker, candidate for Memphis City Council, Super District 8, Position 1. And I'm running because, first of all, I'm responding to many of the citizens who have been asking me to run. And then specifically, one of my mentors in the spring of 2017 asked me, about running and so when she asked me I took it more seriously I decided to give it a moment to think about it and toward the end of the summer in 2017 that's when I decided to run but because of my community activism my public service people have felt I would be a good person to represent my district as well as the citizens of Memphis my hashtag is let's balance Memphis Memphis has a very unique dichotomy and also I have a background that includes being a yoga instructor. So I view a lot of things in the context of balance. And when you look at Memphis in the context of balance, there are many things that are out of balance. And I would like to bring balance to some of the underserved and deserving areas of Memphis. In Super District 8, it has a very a very special makeup. Three of the six poor zip codes in Tennessee are in Super District 8. Over 50% of the city's industry is in Super District 8. And some of our most precious icons to include the Riverfront and Graceland are also in Super District 8. So just depending on where you land in the district, the realities are not the same. And I would like to bring more of a balance to the presence and reality of Super District 8. JB, same question. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Attorney JB Smiley, candidate for Memphis City Council, Super District 8, Position 1. Um, when I think about you know why I'm running, I, I go back to the very same question my father asked me right after I walked around the corner to 540 East Mackinac Street, and I saw a car wash that you know, I frequent as a child. And during that time, my father would drive his Lincoln Mark 7, Lincoln Mark 7 around the corner. We would get out and I would play. But after I moved home from practicing law in Little Rock, um, their car wash was, you know, abandoned. You know, the grass was tall, the paint was falling off. And, and I thought I was losing my childhood. And I went back and asked my father, you know, like, how did this happen? He said, well, son, you can complain about it or you can pull up your working boots and get to work. And, you know, and, and at that very moment, I said, you're absolutely right. And within a couple of months, we bought that car wash. We painted the car wash, we cut the grass. Because I understand that if we want to, you know, move or progress as a community, we have, it starts with us. We have to invest in our community. So from that point forward, you know, it's been small project after small project. And I understand collectively small projects have a great impact. So, you know, why am I running? Because I understand that, you know, together we can move our underserved communities forward. And like Ms. Walker said that, you know, for me, 38126 is home. And 38126 um, is the poor zip code in the state of Tennessee. And to elaborate a little further about 38126, there was a study done by the Shelby County Health Department in connection with the Tennessee Department that talked about people who live in 38126 and 38106 have a life expectancy of 13 years fewer than the wealthier zip codes. Now these are problems. And the way you address problems, you get in close proximity with it. And those communities, communities that have went without for far too long, they need, they need someone that they know. They need someone who has the necessary skills to get the job done. They need an advocate. And every single day, what I do for a living is I wake up and I advocate for people. And and that's what I want to bring to the uh, Super District 8 position one. I want to be the voice. I want to be the advocate. And I'm assuming that means I'm out of time. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Latroy? Hi. My name is M. Latroy Alexander Williams. I'm a candidate for Super District 8, position one. After 40 years of being in the business world, 
president of the National Business League, executive vice president of BBA. People tried to get me to run for city council, mayor for 40 years. After becoming the athletic director and coach on with St. Augusta in 2003, where I was able to take young kids and turn them around from the streets. They was making D's and F's in their grades, but in order to play for me, you have to make C pluses or better. I turned those grades around. We was able to win five straight championships, the city and the county and the state honored us for that. In fact, the Republican Party themselves, and being a Democrat, promised that they would do everything they could to help because of the job that I've done. Again, if I'm elected, if you're 65 and old and meet the minimum requirement, you pay no property tax. That's a law. On the 675-702 and 675-703, if you're a widow of a spouse and meet the minimum requirement, you pay no property taxes. And 675-704, if you're a veteran and meet the minimum requirements, you pay no property taxes. And last but not least, if you're handicapped and meet the minimum requirements, you pay no property taxes. If I'm elected, I'll take the politics away from the politics and bring the politics back to the people as a public servant the way it should be. And the last, Memphis need help and relief. And so my plan is to move toward green jobs operation where President Obama started. He left $4.6 trillion to create green jobs operation. And in 2016, they had already created close to 2.5 million jobs, President Obama, under the green jobs operation. So once again, if you want this city to move up quick, vote for him, Troy Williams, and make this stick. Thank you. Nicole? The question is, why am I running, correct? Why are you running, and what would you do if elected? What yes. Good morning, my name is Nicole Claver, running for City Council Super District, position 8-1. Um, this started for me when I moved back here from Long Island, uh, New York. I've been gone for a while, I came back, and I jumped into, a few years after that, I jumped into a battle to save the legacy of Claiborne Homes, which was named after my uncle. Um, after that, I was inundated with people saying, you need to jump into politics. My response had always been, I'm not a politician. That is not for me. I'm going to let somebody else do that. And I sat back and I watched. And I watched. And I looked at the decisions that were being made. And the reason why I'm running is because I have come to a point where I literally can't stand what's going on in Memphis anymore. And I advocate for change. I think I did an interview with you all. Uh, I was interviewed and they were asking me about the last development, which was Foot Homes at the time. And they wanted my opinion on that because I had been so vocal. And I kept telling them I'm not a politician at the time. I was working on my master's in human resource management. Well, needless to say, I'm sitting here with you all. <laughs> and I think Memphis is at a very crucial point where decisions have not been made to include the majority, and that has to change. Um, I advocate for decisions being made to benefit more than just a select few to move Memphis in a more progressive direction so that everyone can benefit. And if I'm elected, that is what I plan to do. Um, Memphis is very segregated. Memphis is very tense. People do not interact. And the global market is very diverse. When you go around to major metropolitan cities, race is not an issue which helps boost the economy. Memphis is a mecca for distribution. There is no reason we should have the poverty rate that we have. So my plan would be to make it more appealing for businesses to come and help us move forward in a multicultural, diverse environment. So before we get to the first question, I'm going to turn my uh, ringtone off so that we have fewer distractions. And I'm going to turn to Ryan Poe for the first uh, question. Yeah, so good. Thank you all for coming. My, my question is, how big of a, of a problem do you see crime in Memphis, and what would you do about it? What do you propose to do about it? And this is a question, by the way, it's for the whole group. So let's start with JB, but then everyone has a chance to answer this question. I'm going to switch it up who gets the first chance. But JB, you're first on this one. Okay. Um, 
when we talk about crime, okay, time, how much time do I have to respond? I'll put it. Okay, great. So when we talk about crime, you know, a lot of times we, we address the symptoms, but we don't deal with the root causes. And in Memphis, you know, I would suggest that the root cause has to go back to property. Um, when people don't have the necessary resources, they're going to do whatever it takes to survive. Whether it's going out and committing a crime, or whether it's you know doing some things that are uh, less than you know less than ideal. So what we should do, we have to figure out ways that we can directly invest in those communities. And I would go back to um, the Edge Board. The Edge Board allocates millions of dollars in incentives to large corporations that are not normally rooted in the ground in the community. But if we can do that, take a paradigm shift with Edge Board and start giving those money to those minority or locally owned businesses and allow them to give them the necessary resources so they can scale up, they will have the ability to hire people in the community. And you know, we can talk about the statistics every single day, but it's common sense at this point. If we give people dollars in their pocket, they're less likely to commit crime. And so that's boosting the economy. But then you're dealing with the root causes of a lot of the crime, which is poverty. We giving people the dollars they need so they can have uh, a long lasting and you know good life. So invest in minority businesses and locally owned businesses. Same question, Pearl. Yes. Yeah, so I would agree with Attorney Smiley in that you would want to address the causes of the crime instead of dealing with the symptoms. And from where my experience lies, I would like to address the adult literacy illiteracy problem here in Memphis. So if we're investing in, in businesses and we're encouraging people to participate in workforce development program, if we're deciding that people need to work, and I do believe that we need to come up with creative strategies to get more people working. People who work don't take sick leave to go break into someone's home. People who are working don't use their vacation time to go carjack someone. So going back to the beginning of my statement, dealing with the adult illiteracy, we have a disproportionate number of illiterate adults in Memphis. And so somehow we're going to have to harness that and address that. I do have some ideas in detail, but the, the thing dealing with pre-K, pre-K funding, we need pre-K, a child needs to be this, this, and this by the third grade. But something is happening between the fourth grade and the twelfth grade because we're graduating so many students who don't have basic reading and comprehension skills. So if they're entering into a workforce development program and they're not able to matriculate through the program successfully, either they're flunking out or they're dropping out, we need to address this adult illiteracy problem. And as it relates to alternative sentencing, I would like for certain offenders when it's not a real serious offense, if we can give them the option to participate in a re reading and comprehension program and say, you go through this program successively, of course, we're going to monitor them and keep track of them. But if you can go through this program successfully, at the end of this program, we have this job waiting on you. But based on the circles that I've traveled in, the data that I've looked at, if we test the, if we test the populations that are out at the Pendle Farm and down at 201 Poplar, you would find a disproportionate number. Any number is not acceptable, okay? But you would find a disproportionate number of those incarcerated in individuals, male and female, all ages, all demographics, who don't have basic reading and comprehension skills. That's right. And so you have. 16,750,000 people in the United States under the poverty level as we speak. I initiated a program that Hillary Clinton adopted and President Trump adopted called the Compact, which allowed young men and women the opportunity to be home with their kids together. As you notice, that in many cases where you have a situation where a parent is home with four kids, and those four kids, all of them may be going to school, some of them may not. But even if they are going to school and some are not going to school, and under this program you have the opportunity to put some of the kids in a daycare from 7 in the morning to 7 in the afternoon, which give the mother the opportunity to get a job. 
You see, under the compact program, even if you come out of prison and need an opportunity, I don't believe in what we call second chances. To me, if you did your time, you're a first chance, a first class citizen, and you need an opportunity. So this young man gets out, come home to his family, got four kids. He need to go back to school. Under this compact program, he go to school four and a half hours a day to try to earn a degree in, a, in some profession that he is capable of having. Then he go to work four and a half hours a day and get paid $15.50 an hour. The young lady is able to do the same thing. She can go to work in the morning for four and a half hours a day and get paid $15.50. And the young, and in the afternoon, she can go to school and get her degree. So this is a program that can work because it'll allow a father to be home with the young kids. Because when, when Jim, Tom, and Johnny come home from school along with Kim, first thing they do, they throw down their books and they run, play basketball, they're into some kind of trouble. The next thing you know, you hear a siren, somebody's in jail. But if that father figures at home, you see, it allow the young man to say to his kid, look, you got work to do. You got a job to do. And also, under that same program, every organization that does business with the government have to set up a training program in order to train people in the area of the field that he or she is able to work and to learn. Bottom line, there's a twofold question in the poverty situation. And like I said, there were 16 million 750 something thousand people. And the last but not least, Everybody needs some kind of way of insurance or some kind of health care. And in that program, it allowed the health care problem to be um, uh, worked into the same situation as, as Ms. Barbara Cooper have already agreed with me, to take from the city and the county passing a bill to ask for Obamacare, for uh, affordable care here in the city of Memphis, and take it to Nashville and ask for reciprocity. What would I do to um, address the crime issue? My perspective might be a little bit different from everyone else because I'm an educator. And to me, there is a serious disconnect when they are with us and to the point where they graduate, where they are not being fully prepared for the task ahead of them to be able to sustain a, a job. So to me, the issue is education. It is a job of being prepared to work. I would advocate for, and, and don't get me wrong, I've seen a lot of articles where Memphis is moving and making strides back in the right direction to implement back the, the voc vocational programs like for plumbing and um, technicians and everything that were once in schools already so that that population where crime is most, which is like between 24 and 32, where they come out of school and they might not necessarily want to go to college. Those are the people who have statistically been li labeled as committing the most crimes. Well, if you don't want to go to college, what do you do? These are the people who are in dire straits, so programs need to be implemented back to employ them, be it vocational, where they can get a job, they don't have to wait four years to work, and it puts money in their, pro in their pocket. And it's not just money. We have a lot of companies that come into communities and the question is, what are you bringing into that community? Yes, it looks good, but I would think there needs to be something put in place to say if you come into these communities, you need to guarantee a job, not just a job, but one that will provide sustainable income and contribute to the community itself. Thus, eliminating the crop element because you're providing people with a livable wage. I have a question about poverty. Uh, many of you have mentioned that topic already. And you know the statistics that uh, the number of children in this community in poverty is, covers around 39%, one of the highest in the nation. A quarter of our residents in Memphis uh, live in poverty. The numbers for extreme poverty are also high here. What could you do as a council member to help address poverty, and particularly help address generational poverty? I'm going to start with Pearl. Pearl, I'll start with you. Okay. And generational poverty and how to address poverty. So I think to address generational poverty, we're going to have to tap into some of the policies and systems that perpetuate that. So when you look at Memphis 
has a lot of nonprofits. I think we're probably the highest and one of the highest in the nation with <clears throat> nonprofits, many of which are set up to address things like poverty directly or indirectly. And we're going to have to take a closer look of where we are take a closer look as to where we are sending the dollars, the taxpayer dollars, and compare that to the results. We have a lot of nonprofits. The CEOs of our nonprofits in Memphis are some of the highest paid in the country, but are we seeing the net results based on the investment? So as it relates to the generational poverty, it ties back into some things that I've already mentioned about the adult illiteracy, and addressing that is very, it, it, it's somewhat difficult because illiteracy, who wants to raise their hand in the room and say they can't read? And so I would like to incorporate some incentive-based programs <clears throat> whereby there will be more of a willingness for people to participate. Now we have, we have the Mid-South Literacy Council and countless other initiatives in the city, but it's just not enough to, to really grasp what I judge to be the problem and the, um, the depth of its magnitude. And so as a council person, I want to address policies and funding that are, that are contributing to perpetuating this poverty. And also, back to the nonprofits, we have several boards and entities that are operating off the books. And so we need to take a look at where the dollars are going and put the dollars in investing in people and reinventing these individuals. So education is a component, but here in Memphis, for a lot of people, unfortunately, people are not making the connection between education and a sustainable livelihood, a sustainable life. So I judge it to be a multi-layer problem. Um, I'm wanting to be on the council to help address this, boots on the ground, gloves on, and all of that. But being in these communities that are are mostly that are most affected by the poverty, there's also this sense of the city doesn't care about us. Nobody cares about us, and so that's also something that needs to be addressed. And maybe I can tie this into some of the future questions. But I would like to do a PR campaign to get Memphians to believe in Memphis and take pride in Memphis again. Each of you get. Up to two minutes, uh, Mike Pearl got to this question. That's a big question, so David, we'll go across, across the table. Um, I agree with Ms. Walker in the sense that it is a multi-layered um, issue to address, but you know, there's a lot of different things we can do. And I'm just gonna list four things that I would, I would push for, and I'm gonna start with the one that, that I've talked about frequently, which is what happens when people are arrested. So when you arrest someone in the, uh, the underserved community, they go to jail, whether it's a minor offense or not, they get a, they get you know a thousand dollar bail. But in the underserved community, the poor community, they don't have the resources to bail themselves out. So what happens to them? They lose their jobs. They uh, sometimes the children are taken from. Them. Um, they they ultimately you know it, it has a negative impact on their life. And when you lose a job, guess what? You continue to cycle of poverty. So we have to take a real uh, serious approach of uh, taking a, a drastic change as it relates to money bill, as it relates to minor offenses. That's something we have to do. It allows people to get those who are charged with minor offenses to go home and go to work, take care of their children. We, don't, we do not want them to lose their jobs. We want people working in this city. And so we have to talk about money bill. The other thing we have to talk about is you know, the children who live in those um, underserved communities, who live in those impoverished communities, a lot of times when they come home, their parents work on one, two, three, three jobs trying to make ends meet. But what the parent does not have, because when a child doesn't have supervision, the child is going out there learning bad habits and ultimately end up committing a crime. We need to give these families wraparound support, whether it's um, after school care for the children, whether it's making sure the parent has the needed support so that they don't feel like they're in it alone. They need the necessary support so they can do what we want them to do, which is to be a good parent. So we're talking about wraparound support, money bail. And ultimately, you know, um, I talk about my campaign manager a lot because I think she's a brilliant woman. 
well, she, she was the financial um, bank manager at First Tennessee Bank. She created a job and started to develop a financial literacy program. And, and in our communities, I think one of the key things is we do not know how to manage our money well. If we have money, we spend it on you know, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's going to the casino, things that aren't essential for us. I think we need to talk about financial literacy, talk about making sure that, you know, after we're gone, that our kids have something to, to uh, inherit. I think, you know, resources, um, uh, things of that nature that we can pass on to generation to generation, that has to be talked about in our communities. If we want to deal with um, the generational property, we have to talk about passing assets. And then the, the last thing, you know, the one I talked about, um, one of my mentors, Carl Johnson Sr., uh, former president of the school board, and I try to record him as much as possible because he's a wealth of information. He always talks about when he graduated from school, it was a necessity, it was a requirement that you graduate with some type of trade skill. You, you will graduate with some type of trade skill. So if you didn't choose to go to college route, guess what you can do when you graduated? You could go off and become your own big boss. You had a skill that you can put to work, put to use right then, and you can go make some money. You can make a, uh, a living without committing a crime. I think these are the things that we need to talk about. We need to talk about wraparound support for parents and making sure the children have support need. We need to talk about financial literacy in these communities. We need to talk about making sure that trade school is fully integrated, like it used to be, into our schools. And we need to talk about um, addressing the money bail system as it relates to minor offenses. It causes people to lose jobs, lose their children, and ultimately uh, perpetuates the generational property issue. I think those are the things that we need to talk about. And, and when I'm on the council, speaking to an existence, those are the things I want to push for. I'm going to push for viable solutions now, not tomorrow. So, Troy? And so, I think I address most of which the question that you asked in both of my estimations. However, we can create all the housing other areas of situation that will hope to eliminate crime. But you must be created to create opportunity, you see. And that's what I'm about, creating opportunity. This is why I've initiated to make sure that if I'm elected, my third business of oil is to turn Mud Island into an international trade center, which will create 50,000 new jobs paying from 30 to $300 an hour. As I said before, President Obama left $4.6 trillion, which is one fourth of the GDP of an American productivity. Really smart to, uh, and that money, some need to come to Memphis. It's all over the country in other states where they've created many jobs. Like I said, $2.5 million have been created so far under the green jobs operation. President Obama planned to create $5 million over a period of 10 years. And so that money is there. Then I'm going to move forward to President Allen and turn President Allen into a green jobs process, which once again create 80 to 100,000 new jobs paying from 29 to $375 an hour. This is what we need. You see, we can build all the housing, and try to find ways to eliminate property. But unless you create opportunity and jobs where people are able to make money and pay for those housing, you're left with nothing. And so my position is this, is that, of course, again, as, as I said earlier, I think I addressed that in both of my summations. And I think she hit the nail on the head, too, to some extent when she talked about the, the, the jobs when you get out of high school and be able to learn a trade. All of that is addressed under the compact program. So once again, like I said, if I'm elected, you can rest assured that my first priority is going to be to create opportunity, jobs. We, that's what we need in order to help eliminate crime. And the programs that we need to, to, to look into is to make sure that all these programs are not duplicated. Thank you very much. Nicole, same question. Um, what would I do as a city council person to help um, prevent generational poverty? Yes. In the scope of a city council person, I'm actually limited to funding. So my issue 
and what I would take is priority for kids. We'd have to make them first. A lot of community centers when I was growing up used to help. So it wasn't all on the parents who are working several jobs. I would advocate for funding to go to those to help. And once people know better, they do better. A lot of the generational curses or a lot of the generational poverty is just because people have not seen better. So if you haven't seen better, you can't teach your kids what you don't know. I would advocate for a lot of the, I'm for growth, I am. Uh, Memphis is growing, you go to Binghamton, you go downtown, you go all these places, we are growing, we are building. I would strongly urge and advocate for these um, communities to be included. We would put aside a percentage of all these developers and be like, if you're coming into this community, this has to go to the community, which would help with the kids, which would help with poverty, which would help the generational poverty that we see. Because if we jump in, parents might not adjust to it, but you could get the kids that are coming up. And that's where the community centers will come on board, some of the nonprofits will come on board. As a city council person, my funding would go to those developers and developments who say, yes, we would put this money aside to help the community. And that addresses the poverty issue for the kids, because the kids have to be the priority. Definitely, you have a couple topics you want to do. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, economic development. Uh, what do you think should be the course that the city should take? If you're on the council, what is it that you would advocate in terms of economic development for the city? Now the program seems to rely on pilots. Um, is that the right course? And I jump in. Okay. Um, I stated previously, I'm taking a paradigm shift when it comes to the edge board. And, you know, I'm assuming that the edge board is going to continue to be viable, a viable entity. So I would suggest that instead of giving or allocating funds to larger corporations seeking to come into Memphis, I think we need to invest in the, um, the building blocks of our community, which is small, locally owned businesses. And I would say if we're going to give tax breaks to companies, we need to go, we need to start there. And, and like I said once before, we need to give them the necessary resources so they can scale up. We, we, we're growing these small businesses, they're gonna do what we should be doing, which is hiring people in our community, putting dollars in their pockets, creating jobs for people in our community. And guess what they're not gonna do? They're not gonna leave because they're rooted and grounded in this community. And it's always a concern. We talk about electric lust giving them, we gave them a lot of money, a lot of tax breaks, but guess what? They left. But we give it to the locally owned business. They're not going to leave because this is Memphis's home, Memphis's life. This is Memphis is where their family families are. So we have to talk about putting money in these locally owned businesses. I don't think I don't think we could we should shift the conversation anywhere else. We have to talk about it now. We have to start doing it now. If not, you know, we're going to have communities where they're going to continue to die out. If we look at what's happening in three eight one two six. I stood in front of the 